All right, so today's topic continues the theme of polarization. And uh, we could have we could have done all of this right after we covered Maxwell's equations. And in fact, I think this might have today's lecture might have been more natural there. But uh, having gotten some experience with playing with optics and light and the complex fields with the uh, with the cavity, um, and then having talked about polarization in the last two lectures, uh, this this topic also fits in perfectly here because the the idea is you have a reflection of a light off of a surface, say off of the front of a piece of glass, and the different components of polarization of that light act differently when they are reflecting and transmitting through an interface like that. And this is purely a consequence of Maxwell's equations. Uh, but the, the motivation for it is, is manipulating polarization and understanding why certain things are polarized, why certain things are not polarized, why, for example, one might want to wear polarized sunglasses because reflections off of a lake or a surface, um, other surfaces can tend, tend to be polarized. And uh, these, these relations were derived by this Frenchman named Fresnel. And of course, because it's French, it's pronounced differently than it would be pronounced in English. Um, and uh, apparently he is really credited as being the, the person who provided the most convincing evidence to, uh, yeah, of, well, the most convincing arguments for the wave nature of light. So uh, before then, Newton's corpuscular theory was kind of pretty popular. And then after some of these uh, diffraction and inter interference experiments, which we'll talk about starting next time, and uh, actually deriving some of these polarization effects from what were familiar theories of waves, so sound waves and waves on water, uh, people became pretty, pretty convinced that light was a wave. Then, of course, later, people discovered that light also acted in many ways like a particle. But uh, as we'll see uh, toward the end of the class, when we talk about quantum optics, and especially if you take Jedi quantum, the, the wave nature is still there. The, the quantum mechanics equations, of course, are, like Schrodinger equation are wave equations. And the equations governing the, the quantum nature of the photons, they are still at, at the heart, Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations are already relativistic, and they're already the equations you start with uh, when you talk about quantum quantum light, the only difference is the energies involved in the field aren't just continuous intensities, but they 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 are discrete discrete amounts of energy, and that that is the quantum part. The way the light behaves and the way it diffracts and the, and the way you manipulate the polarization, all of that stuff carries through exactly from from quantum uh, from classical to quantum, because at at a heart. It's still Maxwell's equations that are involved. It's just the the energies of uh, the amplitudes of of those waves um, are quantized in energy, but the way the waves behave is still governed by Maxwell's equations. Okay, so so with that said, let's let's dive in. Let's actually analyze what what happens when we have light that's shining on a surface, and. Uh, and we really apply Maxwell's equations carefully at the boundary. And, and we ask what fraction of that light reflects and what fraction transmits. So uh, in, in the cavity lectures and in the homework, I sort of assumed that there was some reflection coefficient r and some transmission coefficient t. And I didn't really say where those came from. If you know exactly what the, the surface is that you're reflecting off of and transmitting through, and you know there are indices of refraction, you can calculate that reflection coefficient and that transmission coefficient. And that's what we're going to do today. And the, the thing that makes it complicated is it depends on the polarization of the light and also the angle that it comes in at. So uh, different, different angles give you different reflection and transmission coefficients. And we'll, we'll see all of that. OK, so. Um, Here's here's the the picture, and there'll be two there'll be two different versions of this picture. So maybe I'll draw the first picture way up here, so I can save it. Um, the so let's imagine we have some interface here, and on this side of the interface, we have some index of refraction material 
n1. And on this side of the interface, we have an index of refraction of this material, n2. So you can think of air and glass. Say so that's the, the simplest, simplest thing to think of. And let's imagine we have some light coming in. And uh, unlike in the cavity example, I'm going to draw light coming in from the bottom, because that's just to be consistent with a lot of other pictures you'll see. And so uh, light's going to come in from the bottom in, in this direction at some, at some angle with respect to always we draw the angles in optics with respect to the normal here. So there's some incident angle, theta, theta sub i. And two things are going to happen. And we, we talked about, uh, you know, I just sort of laid down the law, what happens if we treat these as rays. But today we'll, we'll actually work out what happens if, if we treat these as plane waves coming in. So one, we're going to get a reflection. And that comes out at some angle theta r. So it's going to go that way. And we'll get a transmission. And that's going to come out at some, some angle theta t off in that direction. And uh, we saw that if, well, but we saw from rays, just by uh, arguments of the principle of least time, for example, that these angles are the same. Angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. And also from the principle of least time, where the velocity slows down by a factor of n. So if this was air, where n is about 1, and this is uh, glass, say, where n is about 1.5, the principle of least time says that to go from here to here, um, it's best to, to go a little bit longer in air and a little bit less long in glass. And that gave us a relationship between these two angles that obeyed Snell's law. And, and we'll, we'll derive that, both of those from, from Maxwell's equations, uh, plus a lot of other things having to do with the polarization and the amplitudes of the light itself. OK, so this is, uh, let me just put down coordinate axes here. So this is x-axis, it's going to be y-axis, and all axes are right-handed. So x cross y always has to be z. So z has to come out of the board in order to be a consistent right-hand coordinate scheme. In fact, I'm going to make my origin, my x equals 0, right, right at this boundary, just to, uh, so we can evaluate, evaluate things at x equals 0, uh, and that will be the boundary. So this is the, the incoming light. This is the reflected light. And this is the transmitted light. And what these arrows in the, in the language of plane waves, these represent the k vector. The, the k, k vector of the light goes in this direction. And the magnitude of the k vector has to do with its 2 pi over the, the wavelength of the light. Uh, so that's what, that's what these represent in the wave picture. Uh, let's actually draw electric, electric fields. So for a plane wave coming in, in this direction, the electric and magnetic fields need to be perpendicular to the direction of travel, and they need to be perpendicular to each other. And so there are uh, kind of two, two dimensions perpendicular to this, this direction. Um, and, and we can pick those however we want. And one obvious choice is to, to pick, pick one of them coming out of the board. And that's what we'll do first. So uh, we'll have the E field. The E field is going to come out of the board initially, E naught I. And we'll deal with uh, complex amplitudes here. So I'll, let me, I'll deal with the, the subscripts, superscripts in a little bit. So here, E naught I is just the, uh, the initial amplitude of this electric field coming out of the board. And the, the magnetic field has to be perpendicular to that. And so, oh, and, and E cross B or E cross H, if we're going to use the, uh, the term where the mu naught is, is already absorbed, E cross H has to be equal to the direction of travel. So if E is coming out of the board, in order to get E cross H to go in the direction of travel, I need, I need H to be pointing down. So, so perpendicular to the direction of travel, perpendicular to out, that is this direction. So this will be H naught 
i. Okay, so um, that's that's our incoming wave, and we will the the one fact that we will use in uh, in deriving all these relationships is that Maxwell's equations demand that the tangential components of E and H are continuous. Um, on either side of boundary. And, and we'll see that a, a solution consistent with this requirement is that the, the, the Z component of the electric field is gonna stay the Z component of the electric field uh, when we reflect and when we transmit. So if the Z, if the, sorry, if the, if the electric field is pointing out, then we reflect off this boundary. What, what does that mean? That means the electric field is sort of sloshing, uh, would want to slosh charges in and out of the board. And it, it reflects off this boundary. Why does it reflect? Well, there are little, little charges at, at the boundary that get sloshed. Those charges are gonna get sloshed back and forth because that's, that's what the electric field is commanding them to do. And so the electric field that gets re-radiated that forms the reflected field and the transmitted field is also going to be coming uh, in and out of the board. So, so let, let me draw that. The reflected, reflected light is going this way. It's gonna have an E field that's out of the board. Um, e not reflected. And um, in order to be a proper wave that's going, that's going in that direction, E cross B or E cross H has to be this direction of travel. And, and it has to be perpendicular to both E and, and the direction of travel. And so the, the way to achieve that is to have the H field up here going that way, H naught R, so that E coming out of the board cross H going up in that direction is, is the direction of travel for the reflected wave. And similarly for the transmitted wave, I didn't, I didn't leave myself a lot of room here. Um, e field points in, E not T, or sorry, e, e field points out of the board. And, uh, and to get the, the transmitted wave to go in this direction, E cross H, H has to point down and be perpendicular to the direction transmit. So this is H not T. Okay, so, so this whole situation where I started out with, with an electric field pointing in the Z direction, um, this, this whole situation is, is called the S, S polarization. And it's S because the German word for perpendicular is, I didn't write it down, it starts with an S. So, so this, and what are we perpendicular to? We are perpendicular to the plane that I've drawn this, this reflection in. So whenever you point, I, you know, I can imagine I have an interface and I have a laser pointer, I could point it in any, any crazy direction I want at the interface, but the reflection is always gonna come off in some direction and the transmission is always gonna go in some direction. And there is a plane where the initial laser beam and the reflection and the transmission are, are all in that plane, no matter how I, how I orient my laser pointer. And that's called the, the plane of incidence, I think. And there are two, two polarizations with respect to that. There's, there's the S polarization, which is perpendicular to that plane. And then separately, I'll draw a whole, a whole second picture with the opposite situation, the P polarization, where the uh, the polarization is is uh, is in the in the plane, it's parallel to the plane. 
So, so the H, again, in optics, we, we obsess about the E's and the H's kind of come along for the ride. So, so when the E's are perpendicular, we use the German letter for perpendicular, S. And when the E's, when the roles of E and H switch in my other drawing, so when we consider, instead of uh, having an incident wave polarized in the Z direction, if we have it polarized in, in the opposite direction, um, E, that all the E's are now gonna be in, in the plane. Uh, they're going to be parallel to the plane of, of incidence. And uh, conveniently, the German word for parallel starts with P. So that, that other situation is gonna be called P-polarized. So we'll do all the hard work for this S-polarized S situation. I'll draw the picture for the P-polarization, but I'm not gonna go through the parallel, uh, parallel math because everything is you know, sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence with that. The only thing that changes is the thing about the right-hand rule. So that if E is pointing in some direction in order to get consistent, uh, consistent right-hand rule H fields, they have to point in, in different directions. So that's that that'll be what what changes. All right. So so with that said, let's let's start this. And so we're going to consider, you know, because Maxwell's equations are linear, we can solve solve for the solve for some basic situations, and then any arbitrary situation we can get by adding up the right set of basis situations. And so there's two senses of of this that we're going to use. One is the fact that we're considering z. Z polarization and the orthogonal polarization. It's not quite X or Y, you know, it depends on the angle of incidence. Um, but Z, Z polarization is one basis, and then something in the XY plane is the other basis. Um, and then the other sense of orthogonality that we'll use and, and linearity is we will only consider plane waves at a single frequency. And we'll just pick a wavelength on one side. Uh, and solve solve the equations for that, and then because the equations are linear, we could say, well, if if this incoming wave were a combination of a bunch of frequencies, I could just break them up into into single single frequency single wavelength solutions, ask what happens to each of them, and then uh, add add all the reflections up for all the different wavelengths, add all the transmissions up for the different wavelengths. But the the uh, you know the phases and everything else, and even even these indices of refraction might depend on the wavelength. And so uh, you uh, you will uh, it, you can you can do it for each component individually, and then add them all up at the end. All right. So with that said, let's let's consider a monochromatic plane wave, and let me just start writing down what what the plane wave actually looks like before we apply this this result from, from Maxwell's equations. Uh, okay, so, so the E initial, I'm gonna write it as the complex spatial coefficient. So I'm not gonna bother with the time dependence, but this is like a snapshot at t equals zero or the thing that multiplies e to the minus i omega t. This is some, some complex constant, E naught initial. E to the i k initial dot r. And in the first set of examples we'll look at with this s, this s polarization, um, all these e vectors are going to be pointing in the z direction only. But this is apply in general. So there's reflected wave e naught r plus e to the i k r. R and the transmitted wave. And I might, I'm going kind of fast here, so if I make a mistake, uh, someone, someone should point it out and I'll, and I'll fix it. Dot R. Okay, so, so what are our, our knowns or our givens in this problem? Well, we're given the incoming angle we're given the two indices of refraction, and we're given some, some amplitude. And here in this S basis, you know, the, the, the uh, S polarization, uh, I'm going to assume that the electric field is all in the Z direction. 
Uh, and so that's that's what we're given. And what we want to find out are basically everything else. We don't, we haven't yet proved that these angles are the same. We haven't proved that these two angles obey Snell's law. We we want to derive the reflection coefficients, like what fraction of this incoming amplitude gets reflected, the transmission coefficient, what fraction of the incoming amplitude gets transmitted. Um, we want to derive all of those things. And, and they will be different for the S polarization and for the, the P polarization. Okay, so, so what is our first, um, our, our first, uh, our first equation. Well, so if you think about these as plane waves, let, let's look at these, these complex, complex exponents here. If you look at these as plane waves, in, in this plane, in this coordinate system, the, the uh, wavefront planes are perpendicular to the, uh, the, the lines, the paths here. And so if they really are truly infinite plane waves, there would be infinite waves coming in, hitting this wall, infinite waves coming out, hitting this wall, infinite waves going this way. And what that means is in this whole situation, even though it's kind of complicated, nothing depends on the Z direction, right? That's true both for the S, S polarization and if it was polarized some other way, that's just a, uh, a fact that these are plane waves whose phases, phase, constant phase fronts are, uh, are perpendicular to the direction of travel. So this K dot R can't depend on Z. It's, it's independent of the Z direction. It only depends on X and Y. And in fact, we can, we can write these exponents, um, any of these. So I'll just, I'll just use, uh, I'll just do one example. So the, well, a generic e to the i k, k dot r for us. This is gonna be um, e to the i times the magnitude of k, or just k times y Right, the magnitude of y times uh, cosine cosine of the angle in between, so theta k y. So um, where where does that come from? Well, this this k k vector points in this direction, and uh, the y vector points up and um, well, let me let me let me say that a little bit more more carefully. So so if we take um, oh I forgot to mention yes we're, we're doing this all at the boundary so so x equals zero so this is independent of z because they're plane waves we're evaluating these things at x equals zero so let me just make that more clear here so this is at at x equals zero, so it can't depend on x. So it only depends on y. So at, at this point here, this dot product between k and r is really a dot product between k and, and y. And the dot product between k and y, since it doesn't depend on z and x is zero, has to be k uh, times the magnitude of y times the cosine of the angle in between them. And the cosine of the angle in between the k vector and the y vector at any point is gonna have to do with the sine of this angle, right? So the cosine, cosine of this angle is either plus or minus the sine of this angle, depending on the geometry. So let me write, let me write this for, for each of these here. So what we wanna say is that at x equals zero, at x equals zero, um, and, and this is for, for all y. Our, our boundary condition says that the tangential components of E and H are continuous on either side of this boundary. So what are the tangential components of E on the left side of this boundary? Well, that's gonna be the tangential component of E naught I, which is E, e naught I in the Z direction plus, and then the, 
that gets multiplied by e to the i uh, k i times y times, in this case, it's just a positive sign, theta i, because that triangle is, is uh, sort of the normal triangle with positive angles. Oops. Um, that's the that's the component of the incoming wave. Also on this on this left side of the boundary, there's the z component of the reflected wave. E not reflected z. E to the uh, i k reflected y sine of theta r. So same deal here. Cosine of, of that angle is the sine of this angle. And the sum of these two z components has to equal the z component on the other side. So e, e not transmitted z component plus e to the i, k transmitted y sine of theta t. Okay, now this equation is evaluated at x equals zero because that's the boundary, but it has to be true for all y. So I have to be able to plug in any y I want and this equation has to be true. So um, this is a pretty, pretty common argument in, in a lot of physics, but if, if this whole function has to be equal to this whole function for any value of y, that means that this, is, this equation isn't an equation about the coefficients, it's an equation about the, the functional dependence. It's about the shape. So, you know, if you just look at the real components of these, there's some cosine, and that cosine has to be, has to have the same waviness, the same wavelength, and the same starting point if you're going to add these two things together and get this thing. For, for any value of y, the, uh, the functional form of that cosine has to be the same. And Separately, you could say something about the coefficients, which we'll do next. But uh, the first thing to notice is that just to get the, the waviness the same, uh, that, says, that says that all of these things in this exponent, anything that multiplies y has, has to be the same. So ki sine of theta i has to equal kr sine of theta r, and that has to equal kt sine of theta t in order for this equation to be true for, for any y at all, in order for it to have the same, same waviness. Okay, so um, let's just talk about the meaning of these k's for a second. So k, maybe I'll switch colors. k as a, a magnitude um, this, this was always two pi over lambda. And if you have a wave in air, its wavelength is long. And if you put it in glass, its wavelength gets shorter. And so the amount, if we wanted to write this in terms of the vacuum wavelength and the index of refraction, this would actually equal n times two pi over lambda naught in vacuum. So more radians go by per meter if the index of refraction is, is high, and fewer radians go by per meter if the index of refraction is low. So k itself depends on the index of refraction and, and the, the vacuum wavelength. And the vacuum wavelength depends on uh, frequency of light. Um, and so the, the vacuum wavelength is the same on both sides and the frequency because the frequency of light is the same on both sides. And so all we need here is that the k's themselves are proportional to n. So I'm going to drop this overall constant of proportionality because it's the same for all of them. But now, now we can see that uh, this says that n, well, the n on for the incoming wave is n1, so n1 sine of theta i 
equals the reflected wave, it's also N1, N1 sine of theta r. And for the transmitted, it's N2 equals N2 sine of theta transmitted. Okay, so these first two, uh, this first equality here says that the, we can cancel the N1s and we see that the signs of these two angles are the same. And because in order to be reflected, it has to come out this way. We're not, we're not talking about stuff that goes this way. That means that the angles themselves have to be the same. There's no, there's no SIGN ambiguity. There's no sign ambiguity in setting these trig signs equal to each other. So this first e equality implies that theta I equals theta R. And now we can take the equality between these, these outer two and that equality gives us Snell's law. So that says that N, N1 sine of the incoming equals N2 sine of the out, uh, outgoing, uh, outgoing ray. So this is Snell's law. So already from, from thinking about waves and boundary conditions of waves, we've derived the, the two, uh, two things we had before in, in ray optics. The fact that angle of incidence equals angle of reflection and Snell's law. Okay, so, so that's, that's all we, we could get from, from ray optics. Here we can get more than that. Uh, we can actually get the reflection and transmission coefficients. So uh, let, me, let me do that. So I'm gonna, uh, it's going to get annoying because I have to erase, erase a lot of things that I might want to refer back to later. But I'll, I'll start here. All right, Rock so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to continue with this equation that we were just continuing with. We just started with the boundary, boundary condition that the tangential components of E on the left and on the right have to be equal to each other. Um, but now, now we know that since all the phases have to be equal, since this is true for all y, all the phases have to be equal, that gives us a very simple relation for the, the coefficients. So that just says that um, E naught i plus uh, the z component of that plus E naught r z component to equal e naught t z component as, as a complex number. So since, since functionally these are the same function, I can just cancel them all out. Um, and let me, let me just rewrite this as, let me just divide through by this, which is kind of a weird thing to do, but let me just do that and, and write this as, uh, I'll just do it here so I don't have to take up more room here. Divide by e naught t z plus now this equals one. Okay, so this will be our first equation that we'll use to, to get reflection and transmission coefficients. And the second equation you can imagine uh, that this has to do with the components of H because that's the other thing that needs to be continuous across the boundary. So let me Let me write that. Uh, yeah, let me get rid of this. And okay, so before before I just write write what that is, let me remind you what the relationship between the electric field and the magnetic field is for, for a plane wave. And it's not, not the B magnetic field, but the H magnetic field where the, the mu naught is, is uh, absorbed in there. So this is something that, that we, we talked about when we talked about plane waves, but just for, for any plane wave, for any plane wave, I know this marker is a little dim. For any plane wave, the H component equals 
the E component times some constant that depends on the index of refraction and the square root of epsilon naught over mu naught. So with, with our definition of H, you could have gotten this from, uh, from stuff back in physics 51 with the relationship between the E and the B components uh, being the, sp the speed of light. And that's, that's where the end comes from because the speed of light is, depends on the material. So this is for any plane wave, just in order to be a consistent so plane wave solution to Maxwell's equations, not only do they have to be perpendicular to each other, but they have to have this, this relationship in amplitudes. And the, uh, the uh, boundary condition here says that the tangential components have to be continuous. So E, e was tangential to this interface automatically because it only had a Z component. H is not tangential to the interface. All right, so we have to be a little bit careful about the vector, vector nature of this equation. Now, what, of, of these components of H, which one is tangential? Well, H has a little, bit of, a little bit of X and a lot of Y, a little bit of X and a lot of Y, and it's the Y component that's tangential here. So to take the, uh, the boundary condition here for H, this boundary condition only says something about the Y component of the H field. So let me write that. I kind of want two, two lines here and I've got room for one. So I may write a little bit, I may write a little bit small here. So H, well, I'll, I'll write it over here. Okay, H naught um, I, the Y component of that plus H naught reflection Y component has to equal H naught transmission uh, transmitted Y component. All right, so let's let's turn that turn that into uh, actual components using this relationship between the H's and the E's, because we really care about the E's. H's just come along for the ride, and and the angles here. And this is this is somewhere where uh, I'm a little bit short on time, so I'm not going to draw all the relevant triangles. You can imagine doing some of the geometry. Um, when I write this equation, I'm also just going to cancel out the square root of epsilon naught over mu naught because that's the same in all three of these terms. So let me just write the first term. The first term is going to it's going to have to do with uh, e e naught i uh, well e naught i z component right e e is all z components so that's that's where it's e naught is. Um, and then for the incoming wave, the index of relevant index of refraction is N1. And in order to get the Y component of this H here, um, I need to take a cosine of this angle, right? As this angle shrinks down to zero, this becomes, this H becomes completely Y component. So that therefore it's a cosine, but it's also pointing down. So it's, this is actually negative cosine of theta i. So that's this first term. And then I'm going to just cancel out the square root. So plus the second term is going to be e, e naught reflection is a z component. Reflection is also index of refraction n1. And here, um, this one's pointing up here. So this is a positive cosine cosine of theta r. And we already know these two angles are equal to each other, but I don't have to put that in. Um, and these things equal uh, this transmitted z, uh, transmitted uh, magnetic fields y component, which is the E naught transmitted z component from here, the relevant index of refraction is N2. And the relevant cosine, since it's pointing down, would be minus cosine of theta t. And remember, the up and down came from the right-hand rule. So that, that gives us our, our set of signs here. OK, so um, 
So now we have two, two equations. I guess I can get rid of this. I don't know why I didn't get rid of this earlier. Now we have two equations for our uh, for our e components, which is what we really care about. And this equation and this equation, let me write this equation in sort of a similar form where I divide divide through by stuff. So uh, let me, since, since these angles are the same, I can just factor those out and divide. I'll just, I'll just write the result here and you'll see where this comes from in a second. This is E naught I Z. So this is this first term. I've divided out N1 minus cosine uh, theta i. So I divided out the coefficient of this. So that, that turns this positive version of this into a negative version minus e naught r z component. Um, and I'm going to divide through by e naught t z. So on this side, I have, um, I have n2 cosine of theta t. And since I've divided through by a negative here, a negative n1 cosine, that's that's where this negative has gone. And that turns this into an n1 cosine of theta i. So I've used the fact that theta i equals theta r. I haven't used Snell's law yet. If I if I tell you a theta i, you could go through the trig and get, get a theta t. So theta t isn't independent. But uh, it's it's not worth writing all kinds of inverse cosine of the inverse sine of blah 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 blah. I'll just keep it the way it is. So now we have two equations and basically two two unknowns. So our initial electric field is is a given. So we want to know um, the outgoing uh, outgoing radiation and the transmitted radiation. We want to know the coefficients there. And so if we add these two equations together, the second term is, uh, the second term cancels out and, and we get, uh, we get two E naught I Z over E naught T plus equals, well, this is gonna be one plus this and two cosine theta T and one, it's not sine, cosine. Cosine theta I. Um, what is this? Well, this is almost, well, if, if we had the transmitted amplitude over the initial amplitude, that would be T, the transmission coefficient. So this thing is one over T. So if, if I solve for solve for T there, so, so T in for this S, S situation is E naught T plus over E naught I plus the transmitted amplitude over the initial amplitude. If I were to just solve for T, uh, what do I get? I get two N1 cosine theta I over N1 cosine theta I plus N2 cosine theta T. Okay, so that that is pretty much all all I'm going to do in terms of math. I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures, but I've got the transmitted transmission coefficient, the complex transmission coefficient, the ratio of the complex amplitude of the transmitted wave over the initial wave, in terms of things I I either control like theta i, or things that are just properties of the situation, like the two indices of refraction. So I control theta i, that's my one free parameter here. Um, and I have two indices of refraction and uh, theta t is, is just a function of all that stuff. So that's not an independent parameter. 
Now, if instead of adding these equations, I subtracted them, I'll get the reflection coefficient. And then I could do this whole procedure all over again for the opposite polarization. And uh, that's not super enlightening having done it once, but let me just share for, for one minute uh, this, these pictures here where these are plotted for sort of typical situations. So if you're going from air into glass, the, the reflection coefficient, so sorry, these are the transmission coefficients for transverse electric and transverse magnetics. These are basically the S, the S polarization situation and the P polarization situation. They, they have this form here. And uh, if you plot the magnitude squared of this, you get, uh, instead of having these nice smooth curves, the magnitude squared go, uh, you know, ha have these more complicated forms here. And what's interesting is that one of the two polarizations goes to zero at some particular angle. And so if you shine, this is the ref reflectivity. So if you shine light of that polarization on a piece of glass at this exact angle, which you can calculate based on these, uh, these equations, none of it reflects. You get, a, you get zero reflection. All of it transmits, all of it goes into the glass. Even though you normally look at a piece of glass and it's slightly reflective, if you happen to shine the right polarization at the right angle, it would all go into the glass. And that angle is called Brewster's angle. And that's a way to make polarizers because you know if you're shining stuff at that angle into glass, whatever it does reflect is, is the other polarization. So uh, there's a kind of a whole industry of analyzing you know, different materials and different angles and finding ones with nice angles and building various prisms that do various things with polarization. And it all has to do with the fact that these transmission and reflection coefficients depend on the incident angle and depend on the, the two indices of refraction on either side of this. Uh, okay, that uh, got a little bit compressed at the end, but I think that going through more, more algebra and more trig is, is not, not super enlightening here. Uh, as long as you've sort of seen it once and roughly know where all this stuff comes from. It's just Maxwell's equations dictate that certain things are continuous. And if you were to draw out the geometry of these things, uh, those, those things that are continuous impose reflection and transmission coefficients, which, which can look super complicated, but they just come from simple geometry of how, pl how plane waves work. All right, any last minute questions? We are not going to revisit this, this topic uh, next time. We're gonna have a break and start, start something new, start uh, interference and diffraction next week. All right, awesome.